everybody. So uh, thanks again uh, for Alliance and uh, everybody who helped bring me here. So uh, good to be here. Um, quick uh, word to mention, I, I came down with a cold this morning. So if I stop uh, for a second in the middle to drink some water, uh, bear with me. And if I'm not talking too loud, uh, um, tell me if you can't hear me. Let's do this rather informal or interactive. So I'll show uh, something about our mission statement in the lab and our vision, why we do what we do. Uh, if you have any comments or questions while I talk, uh, feel free to raise your hand. And it might be better than doing it at the end after all the projects because we're covering quite a wide gamut of topics here. Uh, I guess I should thank uh, the provost for uh, making a segue into smart cities. Uh, unplanned segue, but um, let me a little bit recap on why this is an interesting thing, what's going on with cities today. So these are numbers uh, most of us uh, might have already uh, uh, learned. Just to repeat, why are cities interesting? What's going on there now? Uh, we're looking at uh, places that cover more than 2% of the Earth's inhabitable crust. That's it, between 2 and 2.5, so very little surface area. Um, you got over 50% of the population worldwide living in, city to tr in cities. The trend is upwards big time. Uh, so there's massive urbanization going on. Um, more than 75% of energy is, is consumed in cities or in the, in the infrastructure that services cities and more than 80% of CO2 or CO2 equivalent emissions happen there. These are just four numbers that are interesting, but there are so many other interesting statistics about efficiencies, economies of scale, super linear scaling for innovation and other stuff. So cities seem to be efficient, yet there are many, many problems there in living there. Uh, if you can address some of those issues that we're talking about here, um, you're touching on some of the core problems of the planet, right? They're the problems of cities, if we all move there, are converging with the bigger problems of the planet today. Um, now, at the same time, we're seeing technology uh, becoming small. It's connected people in a new way, right? We probably all have one of those in our pocket. Uh, and then machines begin to talk to each other as well, right? So this is just an example of a modem that connects machines to other machines. Uh, People talk to people, people talk to machines, people talk to infrastructure. Our environment becomes empowered by some digital capacity uh, and everything almost starts to talk back to us. Uh, so there's a lot we can see about what's going on around us in real time because of this new type of connectivity or digital empowerment of our, of our everyday objects. Um, I'll give you some examples in a little bit. Now we've all um, uh, seen what happened with the mobile market recently, but this is something slightly different. In, this is a prediction by Ericsson. Um, others had similar numbers. They, they are saying that by 2020, we're going to see 50 billion devices online. That's extreme, right? Because the internet today is empowered by what? One billion servers or so. Uh, we are, what, seven billion people on the planet. This is an order of magnitude more. Uh, it really means that our environment is going to be empowered by an unprecedented number of digital channels. Um, and. Uh, in this case, for example, it, it probably means that we're going to need new ways both of analyzing data, but more importantly, uh, of bringing this data back to us so we can make decisions and actually uh, make it actionable. Because if there are so many sources of data and, and, uh, and the volume is going to be as big as it is expected, design is going to become central to actually harnessing the potential of this thing. So at the lab, what we're doing is we're looking at these changes in technology. The cloud is another example for what's going on. With our capacity to analyze data has increased a lot. And we're asking, you know, is there a new type of planning that's arising from all of this? Uh, is there a new kind of relationship between people and the environment we live in, uh, mediated by small and distributed technologies? Um, we've done this with, um, sorry about this. Uh, we've we're doing this with industry. Uh, and cities, and we're looking at creating these almost like engineering feedback loops in cities. So, you know, many of us have seen um, uh, what's happened, say, to uh, uh, mechanization in the, in the previous century where we created um, control feedback loops with sensing, with intelligence, so small computers taking sensor information and then feeding back into the system to say, all right, maybe if it's a motor, say open a valve or close a valve. 
you know, if it's a bigger system, trying to manage resources in the right way based on some sensor reading. What's the parallel of this in a city? Right? Um, it's becoming possible because, as we said, everything in our environment talks back to us. We have a great way of processing that information. Now, how do you make the city change? How do you actually take those observations you make or some of the knowledge a computer might uh, extract by analyzing data uh, and actuate the city? And it's a, there is a bit of a problem there because if a, if a bus comes and, uh, uh, you know, and you want to uh, enable traffic to, uh, to flow more freely, you cannot just widen twice the, 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 the street. Uh, the city has a lot of inertia, it's heavy. Uh, so it seems like beyond what you can do with infrastructure, you know, like traffic lights and, and the smart grid, the main thing that would impact how a city functions is the decisions that each and every one of us makes as we use, consume, interact with our environment. So in, in a sense, the person, the individual, is the ultimate actuator of the city. And that's where I think it really becomes really interesting. So if we think about that feedback loop of sensing and actuating, uh, it's always interesting to think, what happens when you put that, the person in the middle of that feedback loop? Okay, so you have some sensor in your environment that tells you something about air quality, you mash it up with some map. Okay, it's one thing to give it back to the infrastructure so that it's managed more uh, efficiently from the top down. Another thing is to keep everybody in the loop so that they can make smart decisions in the, as they use the city. And I'll show you some examples about this in a second. Uh, so again, we're partnering with, the, with cities and industries to explore this possible future around the world. Um, we've worked with places from uh, uh, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, London, uh, Florence, and other cities in Europe. Now we're, we're working in Singapore. Uh, starting with Jakarta, there's a new project in Rio. We've worked here with this city, New York, uh, Seattle. Um, not yet in Africa, but we're working on it at the moment. Um, some examples of our projects. Uh, Real-time Rome, uh, this is a partnership we did with Telecom Italia. Uh, a lot of French people in the room, right? It's going to be a bit of a problem for me. Okay, there's at least there's some Italians as well. This was... <laughs> Okay, very good. Okay, so then you'll, you'll know in a second why. Uh, here we partnered with Telecom Italia, with ATAC, uh, the bus service provider in, in Roma, and with, uh, with the, a taxi company called Samercanda. And the main uh, point of this was to create a map, full scale of the city, that looks at mobility in real time. So suddenly, with, you know, if everything starts talking back to us in our environment, we can create real time dynamic maps. Um, and we were focusing on mobility. Uh, we got a room to show this at the Venice Biennale uh, in 2006. That's the centerpiece here. Those six maps were using information that we uh, processed on our servers at MIT and then sent in real time to get visualized at the Biennale. Now, we we're lucky that that year uh, uh, France and Italy were playing the World Cup finals. Uh, so it ca we captured that information on our servers. And here we visualize very, very simple data is how many megabytes are consumed on a cell phone tower when Italians watch their team win, sorry about that, against France uh, in the World Cup finals. Now look at this, it's, it's quite interesting. This is just bandwidth consumption on each cell phone tower interpolated and spread out over the city. Uh, here, you know, downtown, people gathered. There are a lot of bars and cafes where people could uh, spend, to, uh, spend time to watch the game. The game starts at 7.45. All right, 7.45, there's silence, right? <laughs> Nobody talks. It's 1-0 to France, and it's 1-1. It's tied, in half time, people make a quick call, and then second half, still 1-1, there's great tension. End of normal time, still 1-1, first overtime, second overtime. Then Zidane gives the headbutt, and everybody <laughs> goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and then Italy wins. <laughs> and, and people stay up till like 2.30 uh, in the morning. Uh, celebrating, and the next day the winning team came from Germany, uh, where they gathered here and walked in a parade to uh, Circo Massimo down here uh, to celebrate. Um, and okay, th this is, you know, beyond beyond the beyond the funny context. This is interesting. Um, on one hand, because we could, we could see that it captures easily the emotions that people had around the game. You can really see when people are under tension, when people are celebrating and expressing themselves. But can we do something more quantitative with this? So we're wondering first, this, is, this was one of the first projects we did with cell phone data. And it's not, it's not straightforward, for example, if you want to count people, right? Because 
people disappear for 45 minutes when nobody talks, but we know they're all still there in this, in, you know, uh, look, looking at the game. Um, but if you just do some very basic signal processing, uh, you can capture very uh, salient features. Um, so there are dominant features that have to do with how we use cell phones and what we physically do at the same time. For example, now we're here. Most of you are not on the phone. When, is, you know, when this will end, you'll probably send a small text or make a qu phone call. It turns out that there is some relationship between how we use the phone and the activities we engage in. Now, this is all just bandwidth consumption. It's very aggregated, right? So um, it's data that's very easy to use. It's almost, it's almost like junk that's running on the cell phone networks um, uh, that they use in order to manage their own uh, capacity. But today, we can harness this almost to become a like a, a spread out sensor throughout the city that gives us additional types of information. If we think about that pattern, we saw like 45 minutes of silence, 15 minutes of, of talking, another 45 minutes of silence. That's very indicative of watching football, all right. But uh, maybe that's not the most interesting application. But it turns out that if you cluster the city with the same signal processing technique, it's just eigenvector decomposition for those of you um, who, who know a bit of signal processing. Uh, you can find out where people sleep, where people work, where people get retail space uh, service, where people get other types of service. Um, in cities, as at, uh, in the cities of today, that are aiming to become more and more, um, uh, let's say, multi-used, where, where where the planning is trying to stack activities one on top of the other, sort of as opposed to what we did with the you know 19th, um, sorry, with the 20th century cities. Uh, where you know people lived one in one place and came to work in another part of town and to party in a totally different part of town. Today we're trying to densify them to use space in a more efficient way. These become tools to actually understand how we use space, especially because you can differentiate between activities in real time with very non-invasive methods. So we're thinking about this almost like a real-time census. Uh, this is a slightly more sophisticated thing we did with the data where we put a little threshold of acceleration on the cell phones, looking at cell phone data, um, and identified what, what could be likely locations of pedestrians. And these yellow things are the buses in Rome. And then we were asking, OK, so if you know where the people are and, and where the buses are in real time, can we make a system where the buses chase the people instead of the people chase the buses? Uh, that was sort of in a, in a simplified way. Turns out that if you let a computer sort of look at this problem over a few days, you see patterns in how we move around as people. Um, and that could give rise to the design of the, of the bus route network. Right? Um, and then if you see in real time that, I mean, it turns out we're much more boring than we, th than we think. Three I think three places on average is what people visit in a week, for the most part. So you, where we go is dominated by three places every week. Um, and then there are, times, uh, <laughs> there are times that we go out of the ordinary. If you can see that, then you can plan for what extra capacity you want on your bus network to respond to those moments when we are, when, uh, we are unexpected. This is something we did here in New York uh, with AT&T. We were um, looking at a much larger scale in this case. Uh, this was in, in collaboration with Saskia Sassen, who is here actually at Columbia. Um, and with, uh, with several other people, like Bill Mitchell at MIT. Um, and we're asking, OK, if, if urban economics is claiming that much of the global economy is driven by cities, not necessarily but trade between countries, uh, can, you use, can you observe uh, some of these activities by looking at telecommunication uh, data? So from AT&T, we got data about the IP backbone activity between New York and 200 global cities around the world. And each of those things represents a link between New York and another city. Uh, these, the, the, these, uh, these blobs represent the intensity of the interaction with New York. Here you see where, uh, Europe waking up. You know all the usual suspects. Uh, and uh, this is the sun coming up. And uh, South America, Santiago, uh, uh, Sao Paulo, <coughs> Mexico City. Asia is sort of going to sleep. And what it turned out is that by looking at those patterns, and, and especially the time series patterns, you can figure out a lot about the, com the commercial activity between New York 
and other ma uh, uh, main trade partners. It also captures uh, some, something about immigration. Excuse me for one second. I need some tissue. Yeah, Just excuse me for a second. It's okay, I'll grab a napkin here. Oh, that's ah, okay. Thank you. Um. Well, hello again. Uh, so now you can zoom in under this. This is New York. This is incoming and outgoing calls on a neighborhood level in the city. Um, now, I don't know how many of you know Flushing. Uh, this is a 200 country long list that showed us who calls to Flushing and where do people in Flushing call to. Just landline calls and cell phone calls. It picks up immigration population in a very, very detailed way. This, the sample size is several hundred thousand calls a week. And, uh, and the, the number of countries is very, very, uh, uh, um, the list is very long. And you get this, you can get this in real time. So, you know, if you think about the census, which happens every 10 years, doesn't always capture immigration. I think last decade, New York grew by 10%, and the vast majority of this growth came from immigration. So if this is what the city planner is trying to respond to, for example, they could very much use something like a real-time census which could capture uh, demographic composition in such a way. Same goes for, for, for uh, I don't know what happened here. Sorry about that. What about the privacy issue? Uh, uh, it depends. Uh, it depends um, look, in general, in these projects, we didn't use any personal information. Right? So here you're looking at the neighborhood block, this one. It's about one kilometer by one kilometer. And we're, looking, and we're sampling this from the IP backbone. So by looking at packets. There's no way you can tell if, if it's your packet or his packet. This was our choice. Clearly, you can take individual information and, and, and put it out there and expose what people are doing. If you took you know, my Google search, my email that Google is reading today, my photos that are searchable and will stay alive forever, all these, you can create a pretty detailed picture of me. I don't think there's anything fundamentally different with what we're looking at right now. We've been doing these kind of things since, I don't know, probably since we've ac accepted credit cards into our lives uh, and we're willing to give up privacy for a service. I think there's a whole new discussion about the value of data now. If the value of data, and you know, when we're starting with credit cards was for my personal sphere, I'll get some, some extra convenience by giving up some privacy and you know, the same is with, with, with uh, search and, and free email and things like that. Uh, what is, what is the benefit of this for the public good? Okay, beyond the personal sphere, you know, do people know that if they share a bit of anonymous data, maybe traffic in their street can run faster, and air can be cleaner, and things like that. I mean, you know, planning can become better. Whether it's in real time or in the long term, there is a new value proposition, if you want to call it, for using data. And I think this is really the interesting discussion we should engage with now, with politicians, with, 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 uh, with the utilities, with the general public to say, okay, so what's at stake? What can we do with this? Privacy is a very important uh, part of the discussion. But I think we need to understand what's at stake in order to understand really what's, what's the risk and what's the benefit of sharing data in one way or another. Um, so real-time census using cell phones, uh, sorry, using communication information. Again, here we're sampling large networks to try to understand what can we do with the data that's flowing through them? How can we reutilize it for some uh, new purpose? Uh, in this case, we uh, wanted to focus on, <coughs> sorry, on user-generated content. So this is a project that we showed at the Barcelona Design Museum uh, back in 2008. Um, we were capturing user-generated content, some uh, you know, information that people freely upload on the internet for everybody to see. Um, in this case, it was Flickr photos. We've done this later with tweets and with other stuff. But often when people upload their Flickr photos, uh, they're GPS tagged automatically by their iPhone or by their other smartphone or even cameras do that today. And they also say, well, you know, what they were doing uh, when they took that photo. We just captured those tags and the photos and used them instead of to create a description of what the people were doing, uh, to create a description of what's going on in a place that people were at. So we, we call this project uh, Los Ojos del Mundo. Uh, so it's almost like borrowing everybody's eyes uh, to create a, a, a description of what's happening in a place. 
the, the heat map is activity. Here we're just asking where are the parties in Barcelona? Just as a joke, right? <laughs> but everywhere, basically. Everywhere, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, every, it, you know what it turns out? It's everywhere where you have Brits. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, it might seem like a funny question, but it's not a very easy question to ask. Right? If you thought about this, how would you do this traditionally? If you had to ask, where are the parties in Barcelona? It's not simple to know. This is something a bit more sophisticated we did. Uh, Spain has a big problem of drought. Every year, drought enters from east to west. Uh, and, it, and it's it quite an, int quite an intri uh, intricate pattern how summer enters and how it impacts uh, uh, water supplies in, uh, in the country. What we did here is we took everybody's photos, and these are 10,000 or so a week per city. And uh, we, we asked, just with very basic uh, image processing, we asked, where is, you know, what's the intensity of the color green? What's the intensity of the color brown? And we basically observed ground, sorry, uh, green turn into brown as the summer enters going from east to west, uh, just by looking at the images automatically. Uh, so this becomes almost like a, a, a way to, uh, to look at the place through everybody's eyes when we ask, you know, what's the color of the environment around in order to understand how drought spreads. So user-generated content as a way to collectively describe what's happening in place. Um, here we, 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 we wanted to focus on something where we instrument the environment ourselves. So um, there's this dream that everybody's been talking about for a while called smart dust. These small digital stuff that we could throw into the environment and would somehow rearrange itself and communicate. We're not quite there yet. It's more like smart bricks maybe at the moment. Uh, but we wanted to apply that vision into um, one of our bigger, most pressing problems today, which is waste. Um, think about supply chains. This is a map done by a guy called Leo Bonani at the, at the Media Lab. He took a machine like mine, opened it up, scanned what's inside, and with very little web lookup, could produce this global map of how things came together to bring this machine to our office at MIT. Now look how complicated it is. Uh, so it's, 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 it starts from the production of the different parts and assembly rooms and, and, and different uh, uh, stocking areas and the transportation, da 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 da. It's, it's I mean, it's quite amazing how we've made supply chains on a global scale efficient over the past 30 years. A lot of it is using digitization in order to synchronize processes. When we throw things away, we have some belief they're taken care of, right? There's not nearly as much information or control over what happens to things when we throw them away. So uh, what we did is we, we said, okay, let's, let's tag garbage. We, we uh, developed this uh, sensor this thing, is there? that thing was the first one we did. It's about that big. Uh, the last one we did was that small. And uh, basically, you charge it once, uh, and it works for a year. It will tell you anywhere in the world where it is. It's like a stripped-down cell phone. And uh, this is the the, um, the second iteration of the sensor we developed with Qualcomm. Um, and then we uh, partnered with Waste Management. It's one of the bigger waste removal companies uh, globally. And we invited 500 households in Seattle to collect trash based on a list we developed with a, a recycling statistician and uh, came to their homes and helped them uh, tag this trash with those sensors. This is in the public library. We focused on Seattle. Uh, Seattle is one of the more advanced waste removal systems in this country. And uh, our team went uh, and tagged, I think, a total of 3,000 items of trash, anything from a rotten banana to a fridge. Uh, this is me here uh, operating on a teddy bear, and um, and some examples of the uh, stuff we, we, we tagged. <coughs> and this is after we threw it away. Um, now after we left their, the people's places, um, we asked them to throw it away as if we were never there. So the point was to uh, see uh, where do things go from uh, from the bin at home or the curbside. Uh, to uh, its resting place, processing place, um, landfill, recycling facility. And as soon as people threw something away, they got a real-time map, which told them where their piece of trash really is. And after everything came to rest, several months later, we had, um, we developed this map, which shows us um, where things ended up. So here, take a look. 
This is the day of the deployment. That's the Seattle region. Um, these are landfills in Oregon. This is Vancouver, where stuff went to uh, Asia from. This is US. This is, this is Florida here, Southern California, Chicago. Electronic waste, it turns out, traveled quite a bit in order to get recycled, sometimes up to 6,000 kilometers um, in travel. Here, printer cartridges tend to go to uh, Southern California, but sometimes via Chicago from Seattle. So in a sense, this kind of macro picture of the waste uh, uh, removal chain for electronics was not evident before, just because there are so many subcontractors there. Uh, and there are so many reasons uh, for how this thing is shaped, starting from incentives that states give to create one facility versus another facility. So if you have uh, you know, a next volume of, of cell phones to recycle and a state next door has a cell phone recycling facility, why recycle at home? You can ship it there. So uh, turned out that the things we learned to recycle over the past 30 years, uh, the things that are at high volume, like plastic, glass, metals, paper, were recycled within two days in the, in the proximity of where they were picked up. But these things, we're still learning how to treat them. It's not very obvious. They're much more complicated in terms of products. They're higher value, but they're more polluting as well. So that's one of the things we've learned there. But on, this, on an individual scale, we were asking, well, if I knew that this thing I threw away, say two days ago, is sitting on a hill somewhere, not far, uh, how could it create some increased awareness uh, in terms of uh, personal behavior? So one thing is the macro scale to ask, are there inefficiencies? Can we do something better? The other thing is really looking at the personal dimension. <coughs> Sorry about this. Um, now, this thing is showing at MoMA right now. Uh, uh, with, uh, we call it Backtalk. It's, it's, it's part of an exhibition called Talk to Me uh, by, um, by Paul Antonelli. Uh, so if you're there uh, during your visit here, this is uh, on the third floor, I believe, of the museum. Uh, we coupled the, um, what you saw earlier about the, about the movement of cell phones from Seattle to the rest of the US as they get recycled with the second part of the project that we did uh, just for MoMA, which is to see how donated electronics are used around the world. Um, uh, so what is the second life of electronics, whether it goes to recycling or whether it goes for reuse, uh, all by instrumenting these machines with different software that could see where it is, who's using it, what's going on in its environment. Uh, and with the consent of the new owners uh, that receive those machines, uh, we actually send back pictures of how and where they're being used. So you get these, I mean, this is from Kolkata, and all these pictures are sent in real time to MoMA. So if you go there, you'll see how people use machine, donated machines from the US everywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, I think there are like 14 different uh, countries there being represented, uh, all in real time. Uh, maybe a quick note on why, we, on why we show things in museums might not seem obvious. So for every project that we do, we have one component that we call, say, the urban demo or the urban experiment. And uh, there we first start with a brief or with the vision. So asking how can technology help us solve a fundamental problem in the city or create a fundamental new experience. We partner with the city and with a, with, with a, with a member of the industry that you know, give context to this, give funding. But then uh, we look at uh, how, what type of engineering or science or design needs to, be, need, need to come together be developed in order to make that happen, in order to make that vision happen. Uh, and that's where we, uh, we do our more uh, uh, traditional academic work uh, in terms of publication, patenting, etc. So one hand is the, is, um, is the research and, uh, and let's say fundamental scientific questions that can be asked when we collect data, when we uh, you know, present a new type of technological intervention in a place. And the other thing is what we call an urban demo, which is where we actually get feedback from cities, from industry, from the general public uh, about uh, a proposition we're making or a new type of possibility we have for living with technology. So we always try to follow those two paths at the same time. It's a project with SNCF in, in, uh, in, um, in Paris where we're, we're just uh, about to launch it on their ticket selling um, a, a mobile app. They asked us, when we partnered last year, how can we work together uh, to explain to people the environmental impact of different modes of transport? 
So we took uh, um, all the sensors that we could put our hands on inside the phone. So most smartphones today have accelerometers, have GPS, have a microphone, some of them have a compass, and look, recorded all their patterns. Everything that, uh, that, that is recorded on, uh, through those sensors when we move around. And again, by basic signal processing, we could uh, correlate the combination of signals that are recorded on those sensors <coughs> and the mode of transport that one person uh, might be moving in. And then we assign a CO2 emission value to it. So basically what you have uh, is, a, in an auto, is an automat automatic uh, system to figure out how you're moving by foot, by car, by, uh, by bike, by bus. We could differentiate all of those automatically and then you'll get some feedback about the CO2 emission value uh, of that mode of transport, again, for the purpose of helping people make uh, more informed choices. Um, so this is something that we're, we're just going to launch soon. It's been developed now uh, at our lab. It works on a, on a mobile phone. Now they need to scale it up, make it robust, and hopefully let, let their users play with it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, go quickly through this. If we think about, again, this, um, a, the idea of the city as a control, uh, as a control um, feedback loop, We've seen a lot that has to do with sensing, right? So networks can tell us uh, many interesting things. User-generated content can reveal uh, uh, something about dynamics in cities. Uh, and you can instrument your environment with sensors. So there are many options for understanding what's going on, processing this information. Now the question is really, how do we close that feedback loop? So I want to show some example about what you might refer to as you know, more the actuation, actuation side of that uh, control feedback loop of, sen uh, of sensing and actuating in <coughs> cities. This was done with the mayor of uh, Florence um, starting two years ago. Um, the focus was on really weaving real-time information into the city. Um, we were focusing on urban furniture. We decided specifically to focus on a bus stop. Um, and uh, think about all this information we looked at earlier, you know, information about the location of public transport vehicles, congestion, location of people, all of that could really be blended and presented in a piece of, let's say, augmented urban furniture. Uh, seems like a good place to start uh, in terms of bringing information back <coughs> into the city in real time. This was our first um, a instance of the design, so the bus pole. Uh, this is photovoltaic cell. This is a reflective ink display in a higher resolution um, <coughs> interactive display. Computer is stuck into that slab. Um, so this is the interaction that we've designed for the <coughs> large scale of uh, display. Um, basically, from far away, you can see whether you need to walk or to run to catch the bus you're uh, trying to catch, to walk, or if you have time for coffee. Um, large scale, something that would would explain what's going on from far away. Uh, if you want to plan your route as you approach the bus stop, uh, all you need to do is to um, touch where you want to go, right? The bus stop doesn't move, so it knows where it is. Uh, so it just queries the database and, uh, and tells you what's the easiest way of getting to where you want to get, how long it's going to take you, gives you some environmental uh, information about, the, again, the choices that you're making there, you know, if it's by train and bus, by bus and bus. Uh, and if you're going to be late to where you need to get to, it could also suggest you to take a taxi. Uh, um, so this is just an example of how you can use something that's, oh, that's been available for almost a decade, this type of information, but the, just the idea of bringing it into the city in a way that is designed uh, could, help, could help make an impact and improve the, you know, the experience of moving around with public transport. Tourism information can be put on the bus, you can do it on a digital billboard, um, graffiti with your fingers, all sorts of stuff for the community to play with uh, in their neighborhood. Uh, this is the shelter, again, this, this information ribbon uh, in the back, that's the interactive element, and this is the more passive uh, layer of pro physical protection in the front. <coughs> um, this project um, um, is looking at, again, at bringing information into physical environments. Here we're asking, how can you really atomize um, a displays sensing and displays. So if we're looking at, you know, a bus shelter is quite big, you can put sensors on it, you can display with it. Uh, if, if you could actually make 
the sensor and a display, almost one, and bring it down to a very, very small size, we're asking how can you use that to make a very uh, flexible display, something that you can really distribute in the environment. Uh, we decided to um, uh, instrument LEDs with little uh, propellers and uh, <coughs> have them rearrange themselves in space. Um, and, and look at that, it's almost like a three-dimensional screen that can take any shape or form, but also receive information from a computer in real time, uh, in or, uh, which would tell it you know, what color value to take, what shape to take. Well, the idea was, for think, was to think about this as a way to represent information in real time, in a place, um, in a way that really relate to the physical environment that the display is in. So you can do a 2.5D display, uh, you can go more toward the 3D. At the moment, we can only fly 50 of those. Together, there are many engineering challenges, but it seems to be possible to do it, especially if you can control for the distance between, uh, between the different um, helicopters. Um, it seems like with a minimum of one meter, you can do quite well. You can, you can have, you can have uh, quite a few of those running, uh, running together. <coughs> This is simulation here. <coughs> All right. Sort of, uh, I think, third to last. Uh, this is a project that we're doing with Volkswagen Audi. Uh, does anybody have any question, by the way? Uh -huh. Very good point. I mean, I think there are, what are the right questions, uh, you know, or they depend which point of view you take. You know, we haven't figured out yet, for example, um, how to make money out of this, right? So industry is asking, well, well what's in it for us? <coughs> Who was it? I forget. Gartner last year said $4 trillion is the opportunity for smart cities. OK, uh, but uh, it, you still see uh, big, um, um, uh, big blue chip or, or other uh, uh, infrastructure managers being reluctant to jump in. Uh, I think last year was the first time there was really heavy funds invested in this. For example, with what IBM and Cisco did, IBM spent forget, what is it, 200 and something million dollars over the past two years on research and, and on mainly on marketing um, on this idea of smart cities. Not many products yet. Still, we're seeing you know, the old products uh, that have been um, proposed, say, 10 years ago, like congestion pricing and, and some smart grid solutions. But the startup world has not been waiting for, 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 uh, for, the big, for the big guys to move. So now you're seeing new initiatives that try to harness whatever data is out there in order to propose solutions for communities, for urban environments, without asking any mayor or anybody. Uh, there you can do that a lot. I mean, one example is a startup called Waze that is uh, today in, in many cities has the best traffic information. It's instrumenting control rooms in cities. And they're only doing this by uh, asking people for information, for their GPS location, for reports. So they're really harnessing the fact that every one of us is out there driving, probably with a smartphone, uh, to create these very detailed maps. They even create the street maps using those GPS uh, traces. So in places where you don't have good maps, uh, they can correct for your maps. Um, and uh, that's it. I think that is a very interesting thing. So one question is the business side of it. There's a question of governance. Like if you have a startup like this that's doing, uh, say, that's uh, helping people navigate and move around, what does it mean for the government? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you make sure that uh, there is you know, certain quality of services maintained? How do you make sure that there's an equitable distribution of, of access? So that seems like a very relevant question. From a scientific standpoint, that's, that's the one place where there's been no problem of identifying good questions because if you think about it, the social sciences can benefit a lot from this. So far, many things have been looked at anecdotally, for example, with regard to human behavior, human mobility, person-to-person -person interaction. Suddenly you have all this data putting almost the capacity to, for quantitative analysis uh, behind the social sciences. Some people call it the quantitative social sciences. 
So uh, th there are th th there are um, there are very good questions there. You can go back to some of the old questions, answer them in a new way. Um, but uh, I, I think it's a good point. It's not yet clear where this is going. There's a lot of talk, but at the moment we're not seeing this every day in our life. I think there are many many reasons. <coughs> Maybe four main ones. One is the question of business. The other one is the question of you know what regulatory framework or governance needs to happen there. Maybe you know probably probably. Um, um, it means that the is government is going to do less of less operations, more incentivizing and regulation. And then I think the most important question is the question of creating will, uh, in explaining to the public, to the uh, ma mainly to the general public, why should they be interested in this? Why should they want to participate? What's in it for everybody? And then the fourth one is probably a question of technology. There's quite a bit of, uh, of progress to be done there. But uh, I'm, I'm probably probably missing a few other bottlenecks. This is something that we've been doing with Volkswagen Audi. I don't know why it's stuck. Mm -mm. <coughs> Here we, we were asking, OK, uh, take all this data we have about the city that tells us where people are, where events are, you know, where disruption to mobility is, uh, and try to bring it to people where they need it. Again, this idea of actuation. And the car seems like a really good opportunity to close that loop. So if you know so much about what's happening, and you know so much about the driver, given that cars today are packed with sensors, right? Uh, can we intersect those two, the personal profile with the profile of the city that's time dependent, and then offer people uh, s navigation in a way that can really support their goals in moving around. But really, usually, usually transportation or, 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 uh, or driving is not about um, getting from place A to place B, it's about doing something. <coughs> so we're trying to engage in some kind of activity uh, and, and uh, the idea is that if you know something about what people are doing when they go from one place to another place and what's going on, you can intersect the two and offer people uh, a much more useful help. And the analogy we wanted to take here is, you know, like, like a driving companion. What happens, say, <coughs> when you drive with your friend or with your partner next to you, and they have the bandwidth to actually look around and tell you, oh, it's, it's, it's congested down there, make a ride, or make a phone call to ask what's going on in another part of town, or think uh, where, you know, at times when you need to be concentrated. Can we emulate this electronically? Can we create a digital driving companion? Something that can know what's going on far away from the car in real time. Something that something that knows you and can and knows what you are looking for and interested in, uh, and can really make subtle propositions. Um, so this is this is a system we developed for Index in the City. Actually, this is a screenshot from the from the working system that was year one of the project. <coughs> we were just grabbing information from the internet from you know, event listings like upcoming.org. They have 10,000 events a week in Boston. Um, uh, we took information from Sprint and Verizon uh, about where I think it was 1.1 million people aggregated are moving around in the city to create uh, some sort of a, uh, a understanding of the intensity of mobility from place to place. Uh, we're looking at points of interest. So basically, there is a system that's almost like Google was indexing the city constantly to see what's going on there. Second part of the project was profiling the driver and then offering uh, an interface. You're, you're going to laugh when you see that interface because um, it's really, it's, it's a, at the moment, it's a bit grotesque. But, um, but think, of a, think of this as a starting point, something that, 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 would, that would get toned down uh, in order to present an immersive environment for navigation inside the car. So what we wanted to do there is take that data we're talking about and sort of bring it into the car almost like you know, extending the three-dimensional view of the city that you have through the windshield onto your dashboard and letting you interact with it via gestures. Right? So at the moment, it's, it looks a little bit distracting, I understand. But think about this as a, as a beginning of an exploration that uh, once we understand what really is important, what's not important from a design standpoint, we get to keep those essential parts and, 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 and try to see how you, can, how you can really blend dynamic information into your dashboard. Um, about what's going on in the city and how to move around. Can, can I ask a question? Because sure, that, sure. That doesn't seem too far away. So, for example, I've got an um, iPhone with TomTom, Tom, mm -hmm. and TomTom Tom are using all the data to get to them. Are they collecting this data real time? Because, like, for example, 
example, I have traffic where they route <coughs> me if there's a traffic jam. So that, are, the, are they doing things along this line? The data? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're starting to see data about traffic. It's not good yet. Um, in that, you know, if you, I, I, I've, I've only looked at Google Transit carefully. I don't know TomTom well enough and the Waze data and INRIX data. INRIX is the biggest agency, I think, here in the States. It's good for the, there's funny, something funny about how they, how they present it. They say it's 90% accurate, uh, which is true. It's 90% accurate, but you could predict traffic to 90% accuracy as well, right? You know that between eight to nine, you know, that's where most congestion happens. You want to know those, you know, if you really need that tail end uh, when the little uh, interventions, little disruptions uh, can, make, uh, can make you ride three times as long sometimes. Like you're seeing in the city, sometimes crossing uh, from east to west takes you forever. And it's because, you know, a truck is unloading something in a street corner. That's the hard stuff to pick up, right? Yep. You're asking, or you're, or you're telling no, me a story? I, <laughs> I, I didn't appreciate. Uh, previously, this was on a TomTom device that you fixed with a window screen, but now they've just switched to iPhone. So I'm wondering whether they're collecting the data from all of the other sensors within the iPhone to actually collect that data and improve the service. Because I, I, I don't know about them specifically, but I think really the one, what you're describing here is, is really looking at uh, probably they're getting some sort of uh, data from the transportation agencies about disruptions. About, and usually on the large scale you see this happening in highways because highways are instrumented with a lot of sensors already. Even the toll booths can tell you something about the, the, the volume of traffic. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, but really we're, we're tr if, we're tr if we're trying to see something on the... First of all, on the, on, the, on the small artery level. Second of all, if you're trying to couple this with information about the city itself, so it's not so much about where traffic is, that's the first thing, the probably most crucial one. But then, you know, what is there to do, what is going on beyond uh, traffic events, traffic-related events. That's something that we haven't yet seen happening. I think not so much because it's, there's no ability uh, or no access to such data. It didn't, I don't think it's on the mind of the tom-toms of the world. But now that navigation is becoming so much more than just wayfinding, uh, I think we're, we'll begin to see this more and more and more. The big question is in terms of design. I, I think that navigating with an iPhone when you're driving is awful. I don't, I can't, it's crazy. I mean, you, it's so dangerous. And, and uh, really, I mean, e even the tom-toms are a little bit distracting, the one, the one you put on, on the side of the screen, but that's, all, that's, that's, that's somewhat OK. At least you don't need to look down. Uh, it's too small, it's not the right scale, it's too intense in terms of the amount of information you're trying to, to, to communicate. So I, mean, I think we need to, re to rethink this today, especially when materials become responsive and can start to, um, to, 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 to show information. Uh, maybe the dashboard is the best place to do this, maybe not. The question is really what should be shown and, 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 uh, and how you interact with it. So it's a design, it's a design challenge. We're also working now on a sticker that you can put on the on, a, on an interactive sticker you can put on your on your on your windscreen. I think about the way, the way my, my children interact with their world. They think, I mean, they, they have communities. They have, I mean, and the, the big one is they the sort of digital things they interact with. And you know, from what you show there, you, you know, is it is it a direction where you have your own? You could have actually have your the digit, digital community. So your community connected with your business. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very good point. Um, in a sense, that some it's, it, it's beginning to happen because, you know, if you think about everybody sharing data about their location, it's almost like a social network of, of locations where we create together a collective map, right? Um, uh, but when it comes to more personal, your more personal social sphere, I think, uh, I think depending on the use case, I think this is a, you know, you c it could make coordination much more easily. It could make identifying uh, uh, what to do and where when you're when you're um, when you're out and about. It can make uh, scheduling of your meetings from your phone much you know f much much easier. Because for example, if it knows 
this is a very sort of s simple, uh, simple example of something that could happen tomorrow if you want. Uh, if, some, if your calendar is obvious on the phone and you know um, that somebody is on the way from a pla place A to place B and you know that the, there is traffic down, uh, down the street, you could, you basically you know that this person is going to be late to a meeting. Right? So that, that you can make that connection. A computer can make that connection very easily. Then it could help you. You could either you know, reschedule your meeting or call to let somebody know. Or, you know in some way, become uh, an assistant for moving around uh, by, by, by connecting your uh, uh, social engagements, whether it's for work or for pleasure, uh, with um, you know, some information about mobility, both on your car and within the city. I think that, that that intersection is already beginning to happen. And the question is, what really, what's, wh what can we do with this? That's more than just wayfinding. Um, I just want to show quickly um, uh, a few more things. This is something we did with ENEL, the Italian utility. Uh, we started this uh, last year. This was a five-year project. Unfortunately, management changed there. We stopped that project after one year. Now we're going to continue this with uh, two two potential partners. We're looking into uh, working with on this. The idea was to look at, um, they had a power plant they were building in Mohovce. They were actually adding capacity to a nuclear power plant, one of the bigger ones in that area in Slovakia. Uh, and we were asking, how can you use um, sensing and information in order to uh, make the operation and the construction of that place safer? They have people there from 11 different nationales, 4,000 employees on site. And people die there every year uh, building this thing. It's not rare. It happens in the mining world. I'm sure it happens, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure in, in other construction, large scale construction sites, it happens. There, specifically, sometimes people travel two hours to get to work uh, in the morning. Um, and they get to work, they're already tired. And their supervisor doesn't even speak their language. So think of this as a challenge. It's almost like a mini city, right? You can, you, you can take analogies from this to moving around, uh, you know, Jackson Heights here. Uh, where, where you know within the space of five minutes you cross from El Salvador to to Haiti, uh, it's it's, uh, it's a it's almost a, like a condensed urban situation there, but with critical uh, challenges there. Um, people would fall off of scaffolding, for example. We we went there to the to decide to observe what are typical accidents, and um, we decided to um, instrument both the environment there uh, with some sensors, people with smartphone application. Uh, that would measure with indoor locationing where they are to a precise level. That's something that's not existing yet in terms of an off-the-shelf technology. Imagine a, a, the indoor version of a GPS. Uh, and then in the back end, have something like a virtual control room, something that understands scheduling. So they had accidents there, for example, where somebody uh, is using, a, uh, is somebody's airbrushing um, uh, for paint and somebody was welding at the floor below. You can imagine what happens if the two meet. Uh, and uh, you know, the, it's enough that one process is delayed by a bit. That synchrony is gone. Schedu the initial scheduling is not enough. The question is what's happening in reality, right? If, I, if, if a painter is planned to come in at 10, they come in at 10.15 and the welder is a little bit early, et cetera. You can imagine uh, how things can get out of control quite easily and accidents could happen in a place that's very complicated, 700 rooms, half of it underground, et cetera. Um, so, instrumenting the environment, instrumenting people, then having a system in the back end that keeps track of all scheduling, the initially planned schedule, something like a building information model that is time enabled. This is something we, this is what we developed in year one. And then a way of bringing this information back both to the operators, so the safety inspectors, the person who is in the control room, and to the people on the, uh, uh, in the field. So, uh, we had, um, we had the, one of the first things we developed with the, we call it a geofence. So with that locationing information, using the information from the sensors, yeah, that's a good, uh, <coughs> using information from the sensors, uh, we created an assessment of risk level. And say you were approaching uh, a, um, an end of a, um, an end, the, end, the end of the scaffolding, it would buzz in your pocket that you're too close to it. On the other hand, um, if, you, if, you are, if you're walking in an area where we know there's an open hall, a hole in the ground, we can protect you from this. So this is almost like a f virtual physical barrier. Um, 
We noticed there when we studied the place that people ignore their yellow lines on the floor quite quickly because they don't change you know, quickly enough. Sometimes you need to cross that line and it's still safe. Sometimes you need, that line needs to be farther. You know, if you're blowtorching and there's gas there, you should probably be much, much, much uh, further inward. Uh, whereas uh, you know, if, if you're trying to fix something on a place that's after that yellow line, then there's no choice. You need to cross it. What do you do? So these things need to become dynamic. People have become desensitized in many ways to safety instructions. How can you then really make them more contextual relevant and bring them back to the people with their mobile phones using real-time risk analysis and also historical data? Um, we've worked there with the responsive environment group. With uh, The reason I'm not showing too much here is that this was year one out of five. I can tell you what was accomplished so far. Uh, that sensing environment, we've instrumented uh, a construction site, actually at MIT, because um, um, we, we didn't get to the point where we ins instrumented the site in Mochovce, even though it was all designed based on what we planned for Mochovce. Uh, so there was instrumentation of sensors, the mobile phone app for people, and a tangible interface, basically a, a physical model of the place that is empowered by digital data, something you can actually look, where you, something where you can look at the plan, see how the construction is progressing, and safety, l safety level risks were presented uh, in visuals, uh, and you can interact with this, with, uh, with this data with haptic devices. This is from the Tangible Media Group at MIT. So, sensing, processing of information, and tangible uh, interfaces. Haptic devices, uh, like a mouse, is an example, but something that could you know, that you would as a person hold or play with in order to interact with the, with, with the, with the computer. Um, okay, this is um, going back to, to the city here, bicycles. Um, Mayor of Copenhagen started a partnership with us um, in 2007. Uh, the brief we gave ourselves for the partnership is how can we use technology to attract more people to biking. And um, we went there, we saw that there are more bikes than people in Copenhagen. Uh, so it's, it's true. It's they have one point something bikes per person. 50% of the trips are done by bike. Um, the infrastructure there is quite advanced. But still, if you look at it, it, there are limitations. It tapers off beyond a certain distance. People don't bike so much. Beyond a certain age, people don't bike so much. When the topography is a bit more challenging, even though Copenhagen is, a bit, is quite flat, people, uh, people stop biking. So we asked, how can, you, um, how can you use electronics, digital technology on a bike in order to think of San Francisco maybe as a biking city, in order to offer some higher level uh, services within a bike? Um, so uh, we looked around. Um, uh, electric bikes are not there yet. I think they're a bit clunky and ugly. Uh, even though it's a very growing market, um, uh, very heavy, it's, it's, the wrong, it's the wrong design, it's the wrong thinking behind it, I think. Uh, Sensor-enabled bike, or, uh, this is a joke, it's worked by a friend of ours, uh, mm -hmm. but they're, they're not there yet either. So what we decided to do is take um, a lot of these technologies, you know, a motor which is also a generator, some batteries, put a little computer all inside the back wheel of a bike, something that was wireless that you can stick onto any bike, and, and then make it somehow smart and hybrid. This is what it looked like, the, 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 the object we designed. We wanted something that everybody would want to have, something that's almost like the, the iPhone of, 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 electri of, of electric bikes, something sexy that's fun. Uh, and um, and uh, inside it, there's, you know, there's hybrid capacity. There's a torque sensor here that would understand how, how you output energy. And then you can tell it with your phone, make me twice as strong or three times as strong. But no throttle, no, 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 no artificial uh, 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 interaction with some electronics that is different in any way from our old experience of riding bikes. We wanted to keep it the same, very, very simple, um, just pedaling. Uh, there's also a GPS uh, microprocessor in there, four air quality sensors. There's a piece of Bluetooth. Uh, here's a little video. Oh, we won't be able to hear it. now. This is, I'm going to try to turn it up as much as I can.
So this is something that the first the first prototype of this was launched in uh, in the climate summit in Copenhagen. We've kept it, we kept on developing it last year. Uh, think about this, you know, all these applications are circumstantial. Uh, whether it is uh, um, uh, creating collective maps of air quality or doing green miles, this is something that Mayor of Copenhagen proposed. Uh, but all the data that comes out of this is online. You can use it for planning. You can use it for you know enterprise solutions for fleet management. It doesn't really matter. The main point is that each and every one of us can write the software on this, right? The developer, a city hall employee, a company, it, this is all becoming very easy, very accessible. But main point is, you know, you can think of LA as shrinking. Suddenly you can bike through it. Uh, uh, you can think of, of Vancouver as not so hard to climb through. This is the data that, um, that was generated by 12 bike messengers in the city creating collective maps of air quality. Um, these are, back then, mayor of Toronto, David Miller, and mayor of Copenhagen, Reid Biago. Um, David Miller was the head of C40, which was a group of, of, of uh, 40 cities that committed to combat cli uh, climate change, irrespective of, of statements, decision. Uh, so we know that today, uh, cities can do a lot uh, to combat climate change, um, just because you know, of, of the, same number we, the same numbers we saw earlier in the presentation. So much uh, is impacted by what, how cities function um, that uh, that if that mayors can take action today without waiting for uh, for statesmen's decisions. This is what C40 set out to do. He was a big supporter of the project. Today it's Ma it's Michael Bloomberg who's actually taken his place uh, in heading C40, and um, he liked the project. <coughs> And we didn't coordinate the color of his scarf and the wheel. <laughs> the coincidence. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. So. Uh, so, we, r rather than doing this a long Q&A session uh, in the middle, I, we thought of doing this um, uh, more throughout the talk. So, uh, quite a few questions have already risen, uh, but if you guys have um, any more questions, we, I, I understood we have time for two or three. Well, m maybe, I mean, th this is not the first time I've heard that comment. Uh, um, if you think about some of the problems of cities, um, they are quite complex, right? You need, you need people from many different disciplines, many points of view to come together to, to take a look at those problems. And in our lab, we have people at the moment, I think we have about 30 PhDs and postdocs, um, probably from 10 or 12 different disciplines, from social sciences through design to engineering. Uh, <laughs> And this is a result of you know, what happens when so many people from so many different <laughs> fields work together. Sometimes we work on an object, sometimes it's a piece of software, most of the time it's a combination. Uh, you need smart vehicles in the city, you need smart infrastructure, you need smarter people, smarter software, uh, you need good sensing data, you need good design in order to bring that data back to people. All these things are important and they're all becoming now uh, increasingly possible because of this kind of merger between digital and physical stuff. So we've decided to explore as many of them as we can. Uh, it's true that for academia, you know, there's a limit of how far you want to take this. This is why we stopped this, this project at some point. A couple of students are now spinning it off. You know, we, we're not looking into scaling it up or making it robust because that's, you know, there are other people who are better at this and we should probably uh, stick to generating ideas and, 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 and more sort of forward-looking vision. But we're really exploring the gamut there. 